Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ number 68, the knife series where I answer all your questions, whether they're sharp or dull. This week, amongst our topics, we're talking about what are some of the easiest steels to learn sharpening with and also what is it that makes a knife tactical? Let's get into it. Do, do, do. Ta -da! All right, for those of you who may be new to this series, the deal is you get to leave your questions in the comments section below, and we go through and pick out a few good ones to answer in future videos. So if you've got a question, that's where you leave it, just down below in the comments section. First question today comes from EDC David. It's not me, someone else. Uh, that's Thomas over there, by I'm the way. I'm not convinced. <laughs> I'm not planting questions now. I'm not, I haven't sunk to that level yet. Uh, hey, hey DCA, I enjoy the channel from the Middle East. If you took a job overseas, which would last for about five years, and you could only take one EDC folder, which knife would you take with you? Thanks. Cool. Um, I had some fun with this one, actually. And right off the bat, if we're counting multi-tools as your folder, I'd probably have to resort to my Leatherman Wave. But that's no fun. Uh, I, I need to have this, especially because because here, here's what I'm thinking. What, what I'm guessing is the situation here a little bit. Uh, you say the Middle East overseas. So I'm wondering, is this some kind of like military or government contract situation? Uh, if so, I feel like in, in a way you're going to be your own support system. So I'd want to have a multi-tool like that for sure. Um, to pair with that or as the one EDC folder that will take I'd want something that has a little bit of, of tactical usage, something maybe a little bit sinister, uh, but something that's gonna be versatile, not just a tactical knife, it's gotta do everything. And it's gotta last the whole time you're out there, that five year stretch without having to worry about it breaking, without having to worry about a part failing, any of that sort of thing. You just gotta be completely kind of trusting in that pocket knife. So, Sandy environment, I'm guessing perhaps as well, being the Middle East, so I'm gonna avoid uh, washers, or sorry, I'm gonna avoid ball bearing pivots completely. Go with something with washers, because it's gonna be much better in that sort of scenario. Um, I'll, I'll go through my th thought process here a little bit, because I kinda, I arrived at where I was going. I love a crossbar lock. Uh, this Benchmade Griptilian right here would be a pretty good choice, but over a five year stretch, there is an off chance one of the uh, the Omega Springs behind the lock bar here could fail. Whether it's likely or not, you know, that's up to interpretation. I've only had one uh, Omega Spring fail on me over the last you know 15 to 20 years of carrying knives like this. And that's no big deal when I can just you know put it down to get it fixed and pick up another knife, but that's not gonna be an option if you've got the only one thing. So I'm gonna leave that off the table. Now, I like the idea of something with Spyderco's compression lock a lot. Paramilitary 2 would certainly uh, seem appropriate given the uh, my assumption as to what type of job you're doing here. Uh, but something from the SALT series like this Caribbean 2 or Caribbean 2, I think would be even better because everything on the knife from the blade steel to everything uh, inside the internals and everything is essentially designed to avoid rust in all but you know, the 0.001% of circumstances. And that's, that's a big deal when this might be the only thing you have for that five year stretch. One less thing maintenance wise you have to worry about. And this would be a, good, a pretty good choice, I think, honestly. Um, about 217 bucks, so it's not cheap, uh, but it doesn't feel cheap either. 3.7 inch blade, that LC200 end steel, full flat grind, pokey enough that you could poke with it, but versatile enough for other stuff too. You got that nice locking system, washers in the pivot. I like that, but in the end, something about uh, the cold steel triad lock over anything else kind of screams to me as the right choice. So I'm gonna go with the four inch bladed clip point Voyager. That triad lock there really is hard to ignore for this sort of thing. It's ultra strong, it has been shown to last a good long time. It's self-adjusting over time due to the way the, uh, the internals work. So it's not 
very unlikely to develop kind of slop and play even after a lot of use. Uh, regarding adjustment, we do have Torx construction here. Part of me was thinking, you know, might want to go with pinned construction uh, for, you know, just again, one less thing to worry about while you're out there. A little bit limiting nowadays because fewer knives are made that way. And if I've got my Leatherman with me anyway, I've got extra bits. I can adjust them myself. So I'm not too worried about that. Blade shape definitely has a little bit of aggression to it, but full flat grind here as well. Versatile. Everything from opening boxes to food prep. If you're going to need it to do that, it'll pull off the job convincingly enough. It's lightweight, so no matter what uh, the scenario might be that you're dealing with, it's one less thing to weigh you down. It's affordable too. I mean, these things are like 68 bucks, not too bad. So, you know, you have less uh, compunction about it getting beat up or confiscated or destroyed or any of that sort of stuff. And it's got a handle shape. It's going to work well, whether I'm EDCing. If uh, we get into a uh, impromptu camping trip, I can use it for that sort of thing. I think this is a, a really good option for that sort of thing. But yeah, let me know what you guys think of this choice uh, down below and let me know what your choices might be uh, for this type of scenario as well. All right, next up, we have a question from Craig T. He says, uh, when you were talking about the Condor Credo, which is this knife right here, you described it as a tactical knife. What about it makes it a tactical knife? Um, sure, let's get into that can of worms. And I kind of know where you're coming from a little bit, I think anyway, because tactical is one of the most overused phrases, not even just the knife industry, but all over the place. You know, something tactical, tactical, tactical. Almost as bad as ergonomic, which is a hard one too. I mean, when Maxpedition, great company, when they can put out a set of waterproof playing cards and call those tactical, doesn't make the cards any less cool, but you kind of makes you go like, really? Tactical playing cards? Okay. But when we come to knives and what makes a knife tactical, some things are almost definitively tactical. And, and I hate to say it, sometimes you just kind of know it when you see it. Other times there's definitely room for interpretation here. There's, there's a bit of a gray area because there is no definition uh, unless something from the designer's perspective was expressly designed as a tactical knife. So while, when I'm seeing new knives and evaluating stuff, I'll give you a little insight into kind of my thought process, what makes something tactical to me. So one of the things when it comes to the blade shape, typically most tactical knives are gonna have some kind of piercing or thrusting intent in mind. You've got that straight clip point here on the Credo uh, that definitely falls into that, but that's it's not just the blade shape by itself. Uh, going back to that Cold Steel Voyager, definitely a bit tactical, in fact, it could be considered very tactical. Buck 110, not so much, not really a, a tactical knife. And part of it comes down to intent, whether it was the intent of the designer or just the intent of who the, uh, the end user of this is supposed to be, that informs it a little bit as well. But uh, pointy clip points and drop points, often very tactical. Tanto blades, while not exclusively tactical, are almost always considered tactical. Not because it's just down to the blade shape, but again, when combined with the other features you see, it's gonna kind of work out that way. Not as uh, pokey as some of the needle-like tips, but designed for strength in thrusting. Often, you're gonna see and something that I think is especially important for a tactical knife is a bit of finger protection. You see it here in this Kershaw Emerson CQC7. You don't want your finger sliding forward on the blade when you're using it in any kind of thrusting thing. You see that on that Credo that we just looked at as well. Very aggressive uh, index finger groove that acts as a finger guard in conjunction with the, uh, the rest of the handle shape overall. Another thing you'll see uh, quite often for uh, finger protection is something with a flipper tab, like the Civivi Elementum Tonto, which I'll get to in a minute because I, this is uh, one of those kind of gray area things, at least for some people. A lot of times that uh, integrated flipper tab creates a bit of an index finger guard, which is quite nice. Some knives will have big cross guards, especially if you're talking fixed blades. And there's certainly applications where a tactical knife is not going to have some kind of finger protection, but those tend to be a little more specialized. They're definitely out there. Like the Wii uh, OSS dagger is a good recent example, definitely a covert tactical thing, but for a different type of use than some other guys. Definitely getting into the weeds here, aren't we, Thomas? Very. 
I'm getting my weed whacker. <laughs> so getting that weed whacker ready. Um, but so all those things kind of taken together, the vibe of the knife, the features, all of those things kind of come together to inform whether a knife is seen as tactical or not. But a lot of those things that are quote unquote tactical features are useful far beyond just the tactical genre. So you have things that, that you have these features show up in other knives. I mean, originally back when, you know, couldn't even tell you exactly a, a time frame here, but when you transitioned from like pocket knives without pocket clips that just like slipped into the pocket, slip joints and stuff. At one point in time, if a knife had some features like a pocket clip, a lock and one hand opening, if it had those th three things, it was probably considered a tactical knife. I think that's definitely not the case now, but there's definitely a point in history where that combination of things really informed what a tactical knife was. But let me get into some of those things with that Civivi Elementum. The Tonto blade here, certainly useful for EDC. That leading edge can be used for scraping. Things like the one hand opening make the blade just fast to access, more convenient to use day to day. The lock, come on. I mean, the safety measures of a lock, it's not just designed to keep the knife from closing when you thrust it into a target. You don't want to cut yourself your, your finger open when you're cutting boxes day to day or anything like that. And then a pocket clip, of course, you're not going to have to fish around in your pocket for a knife that could be floating around, banging into other things. It'll be right there when you need it. So I'm using this knife as an example, and a lot of those things that go into quote unquote tactical knives are present here. But again, we have to kind of look to the purpose of the knife. And is this a, a combat-y, tactical, fighty style of knife? I'd say almost exclusively no. Um, it's not saying a, a tactical knife can't be this small, but it feels a little small for tactical use without kind of other mitigating features as well. This is just a solid EDC folder. And maybe that's because the Elementum uh, has always been just that. Just the addition of the Tonto blade isn't enough to break it out of uh, those quote unquote confines. You guys let me know down below though, whether you think that's fair or not. But I hope that helps uh, kind of guide at least what goes into my, uh, my thinking when I'm kind of quote unquote classifying knives that I talk about. Hope that helps. Uh, next question, Jorgamund07 says, I use a Marlin spike for teaching and experimenting with paracord knots. However, I've only ever found a single multi-tool that had one, a random unbranded sailor's tool I found somewhere years ago. Are there other multi-tools that have a good sturdy Marlin spike? Uh, absolutely. Um, the thing you're, uh, you probably have right now is probably very similar to this right here. It's a Schrade Old Timer Mariner's Knife. About 23 bucks for these guys right now. For that, you've got a single sheep's foot blade on the side and on the opposite side, you've got that big Marlin spike, which if folks out there, if you're unfamiliar with uh, the utility of this tool, it's not just you know an EDC ice pick or poker really great for getting into and unbraiding or untying knots, especially in a you know, sailing or mariners situation. It's where these kind of live uh, most plentifully in our imagination out there. And these are pretty cool. You got a lock on the Marlin spike right there. So it's not going to snap closed on you when you're getting in on some heavy knottage. They're pretty cool, but I can absolutely understand if you want something a little bit more upgraded, a little bit more premium. Uh, for a, another multi-tool that'll do the job, the Swiss Army Skipper Pro from Victorinox is a great option. About 110 bucks for this guy. And you've got a bevy of typical Swiss Army knife tools. You've got the single one-hand opening blade in this case, a cap lifter and can opener with your screwdriver tips. You've got an awl on the back or a reamer because it doesn't have the little uh, hole on this one for all usage, but you've also got, yes, that Marlin spike. And I like this one a little bit more than that Schrade actually, because it's not quite as sharp here at the end. The Schrade one we have right here has a pretty, uh, pretty pointy tip, which can actually get in the way sometimes. So there you go. It even locks open with a, uh, a liner lock here as well. So you've got a lot of sturdiness built in there. Comes with a bit of paracord right there, attached in orange and 
Yeah. I guess that answers the question. I was trying to come up with another point to make, but there you go. Uh, the other thing I've found really nice uh, for paracord specifically, I've mentioned this a few times on this channel. This knife doesn't have one, but a Swiss Army knife with the corkscrew, the tip of that can actually work uh, pretty decently for getting into uh, tough paracord knots. But it's definitely not as uh, heavy use or varied in use that you can get from that true Marlin spike. Really cool knife. If you uh, want something even different, you didn't ask for a dedicated knife with a Marlin spike, uh, but it's something that's pretty rare. So I wanted to show it on this one too. This is the DPX RYP Harsey Demo Flipper. Now this knife is not cheap. It's about 375 bucks. So if you're actually using this in a uh, Mariner situation, I'd hate for it to go overboard. Ball for your fancy boat. Your fancy boat, yes. Uh, this is the Yachter's Marlin Spike. Uh, three, almost four inch uh, blade here. M390 steel, rides on bearings, flips open pretty nicely as you can see. Frame lock, but on the back side, we've got that Marlin Spike with another frame lock there to keep it secure. Pretty darn cool. Um, I'm actually not sure. So the DPX stuff sometimes is made in America, sometimes is made by Lion Steel in Italy. Uh, and that's what this one is too. This is an Italian made knife right here. Oh, there it is. It says right there on the, uh, on the Marlin Spike itself. Um, <laughs> so I think the demo in this stands for demolition. There's usages for this in kind of a uh, high ordinance type of situation, but this is going to work awesome as a Marlin Spike as well. Probably not effective against Marlin stuff. So. Well, if you get close enough, it might be. Use your imagination. Got it. <laughs> uh, next question comes from Jeremy Bash. Uh, Hello, DCA. I've never sharpened a knife before and I want to learn. What knife slash steel is best for learning with? Thanks for the great content. You're welcome. Um, good on you for, for diving into the sharpening subject. I know a lot, a lot of folks, especially uh, starting off, it can be a bit uh, intimidating. So we'll do two things. I'll say to check out our sharpening playlist on this channel. I think there's a lot of good information on there in terms of different techniques uh, and just you know, background on what's actually happening when you're sharpening a knife, which is pretty important stuff. So check that out. As for steels to look for, stick with simple stuff. Um, I'd avoid D2, however. You can find it on a ton of uh, budget-oriented knives these days, but it is not the easiest knife necessarily to sharpen. Go with stuff, uh, some simple carbon steels, 1075 or 1095, can be fairly easy to sharpen. And something like this, the Old Hickory Paring Knife, it's like 12 bucks with, I think they're, they're using 1075 now. Very easy to maintain, and importantly, a thin blade. I'm recommending these steels, but the thinner the better for practicing sharpening. If you go with, I don't know, like a Becker BK9, which is made out of 1095 steel, it's a great knife, but it's thicker. You're going to be dealing with more, you know, the, the knife is going to get in its way a little bit more if you're just learning sharpening. This is something you're not even going to have to think about really. It'll go right where you point it in terms of angle and everything like that. But nice thin steel, a simple carbon like this is going to be a great choice. Swiss Army knives, a great choice. They're stainless steel is not particularly hard. It is very easy to sharpen. Uh, the serrations on this particular model kind of complicate things a bit, but stick with one of the, uh, the plain edged models, which is most of them these days. A very, very good choice there. Honestly, uh, on budget spectrum of steels, 8CR13 MOV. A lot of the uh, steel snobs out there will certainly poo poo it, say it's beneath them. And while I get that, uh, cause I'm kind of one of those people too, it still is a very capable steel and it is quite easy to maintain. This Emerson uh, Kershaw right here has that and it's also got a hollow grind. Again, think about the thinness of the edge. That hollow grind is gonna scoop the metal out. So when you're actually on the stone, you're working ag less against the rest of the material. You're grinding less away as you're working. Stick with stuff like that. Uh, some of the Sandvik steels as well, I'll throw that out there, 14C28N or 12C27. Maybe a, a bit more enthusiast friendly than the 8CR, but still going to be easy to, uh, to hone and sharpen. So check knives out like those and check out our sharpening playlist. All right, now we come to the lightning round for today. Uh, first is from Alexander Bremers. Hey DCA, I'm getting married soon. 
Congrats. And my fiance suggested a Viking theme wedding. Double congrats. That's awesome. Man, that reception's <laughs> going to be lit. Whoa, we're not talking human sacrifice here. I hope. Ooh. Uh, I want to give my best man a nice knife and was thinking of maybe a nice sax. Are there any modern sax knives out there, preferably an EDCable folder? Sure thing. Um, I really like Civivi's new Relic Flipper, and it has that sax style blade, which, you know, we think of it as like a long sword that got snapped off and a point ground down into it to make a short sword or a short dagger. Definitely have those vibes here. This is about 90 bucks for this uh, Damascus steel version, which if we're talking gift, that makes it a little extra special. You've got the great Civivi build quality for the price. You've got ball bearings in the pivot, that good flipping. You've got the deep carry pocket clip and could be especially important on one's wedding day. Maybe some emergency grooming. You've even got a pair of tweezers there in the back. Uh, but it's not officially a multi-tool because it doesn't have a bottle opener, but that's okay. Yeah, check those guys out. All right, next question from the lightning round comes from Seth Mayug. May or sorry, Seth Mayhew? Is that how we pronounce it, perhaps? Uh, hey man, I'm looking for something similar to a Benchmade 940, but in the $50 to $120 range. If you have any suggestions, I'd appreciate it. Sure do. Here's your 940, which nowadays comes in just over 200 bucks. And I've got something on the bottom end of the budget you recommended. Check out the new CRKT facet, a Ken Onion design, 50 bucks. Definitely, it's, it's kind of like a cross between a 940 and a Kershaw Leak, and you get something like this facet right there. Very similar vibes. It has a solid feel in the hand, thanks to the stainless steel construction and the frame lock. Assisted opening, but not a, a hard assist to close. It works very smoothly and flips really nicely. It has that kind of hardworking gentleman's crossover vibe that not a lot do in quite the same way that the 940 does. This guy pulls it off. All right, now we come to our last question, the most serious question of the day from Jason Dominguez, who says, I would like to know what quote unquote Thomas has for an EDC. And if you can give him some airtime, like can he finish the video with a joke or something? Got, okay. any, got any good knife jokes? Well, he'd missed the point. I had one, but it was kind of dull. We should just fold now. Yeah. <laughs> You see what you made me do, Jason? Killing me, man. I don't know, what, what do you, what do you, Thomas actually usually carries more knives than I do on a daily basis. Well, that's what I got. List them. <laughs> ZT55, Benchmade Bugout, Battle Wash Edition. Knife Center exclusive. BRS Replicant, and Leatherman Pre P4. He upgraded from a skeletal a while. Yeah, that's it? I feel like you had more than that. Oh uh, yeah. I got a bottle opener. Oh yeah, his his EDC fix blade. And what's great, didn't break. <laughs> and yes, he's a big guy with big pockets, and that's why he gets away with carrying all that. Anyway, sorry I threw your EDC fix blade on the floor. I don't know what I was thinking there. Nothing I haven't done to it. <laughs> thanks for sticking around, folks. Uh, thanks for your question submissions as well. If you want a chance to be featured in a future episode, you know the drill. Just leave your questions in the comments below. If you want to get your hands on any of these knives we talked about, we'll leave links in the description. Those will take you over to knifecenter.com. And make sure you sign up for our Knife Rewards program while you're over there. Because if you're going to put your money down on one of these knives, might as well earn some free money to spend on your next one. I'm David C. Anderson. That's Thomas from the Knife Center. We're signing off. See you next time.